In my Beautiful Moments in Games video, I talked briefly about the gameplay loop of Dark Souls. Firstly, I commented on how the game forces you to invest and immerse yourself in the act of exploration, and then I noted how the difficulty spikes at boss fights and ensures that finally toppling a boss is a satisfying experience. Hollow Knight is often compared to Dark Souls and exists in a strange realm of games that are sometimes referred to as Souls-like, despite the core gameplay being completely different. Obviously, one is a third-person action RPG and the other is a platformer slash metroidvania, and depending on what elements you believe compose a Souls-like game, you might immediately dismiss the idea of Hollow Knight being included in that classification. But from a literal standpoint, a game is Souls-like simply if it is similar enough to the games from the Souls series series, and there's a long list of similarities between Hollow Knight and Dark Souls. But before we get into that, let's talk about what it means to be Souls-like. The reason that this genre exists in the first place and where it gets its original namesake is 2009's Demon's Souls. Many hold the opinion that the series didn't tap into its full potential until the release of Dark Souls two years later, and the series has only evolved further with Dark Souls 2 and 3 along with spawning similar games such as Bloodborne, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, and and more. But all of that aside, the initial innovator and the game that started it all was Demon's Souls. So let's go through the list of what made this game and this series so special, and on the way we can see how they apply to other Souls-like games. Before the release of Demon's Souls, there was a lot of trouble in the development team and concerns for the game's commercial success. One of the major reasons for this was simply because it was too difficult. During my research, I found this great Edge article from 2010 that interviewed Sony producer Takeshi Kaji and Demon's Souls director and From Software president Hidetaka Miyazaki. In it, Kaji says, When we first demoed Demon's Souls at the Tokyo Game Show, it was nothing short of a disaster. People were critical of the gameplay and many presumed we were still working on the combat at that stage of development, despite it being nearly finished. When Sony president Shuhei Yoshida tried the game, he spent close to two hours playing it, and after two hours he was still standing at the beginning of the game, and he said, this is crap. This is an unbelievably bad game. The developers were plagued with concerns that the game would not be understood, and that Sony executives would come to them asking to make major changes so that the game would be easier and more accessible. Luckily, that order never came, and the series is now applauded for its difficulty. The positive response to the difficult experiences that the Souls games provided seemed to bring forth an era of gaming where difficulty is more often praised. Think back to arcade days. You would never go to play Super Mario Bros. with a single quarter in your pocket expecting to beat it in one go, that would be insane. Games were unforgiving to new players back then, and very difficult to master. At some point, developers' approaches to difficulty shifted to the point where when playing a new game for the first time, blazing through it without dying once became not too unexpected. And there's definitely a huge casual audience for that sort of thing, so it's understandable, and not every game needs to be difficult like the Souls games. Sometimes you just want to play Kirby's epic yarn and have a good time. But I'm glad that From Software paved the way for more difficult games in its wake, even if it came with the annoying habit of games journalists to compare every game ever to Dark Souls. We've got the Dark Souls of turn-based RPGs, the Dark Souls of roguelites, the Dark Souls of running guns, the Dark Souls of uh, competitive first-person shooters, and of course, the Dark Souls of Metroidvania's Hollow Knight. Really what these game critics mean is just that these games are difficult, and yeah, these games are all pretty difficult and pretty fun because of it. It's generally agreed upon that this is a vital characteristic of Souls-like games, and anyone that's tried to beat the Pantheon of Hollow Nest, which is essentially the final endgame challenge of Hollow Knight, knows that this game is hard. But even before that, even for players who didn't necessarily get 100% or do all of the extra stuff, if you even just beat the game, that's great. I applaud you for that because there's a lot of difficult moments across the entire game. One of my favorite bosses is the Mantis Lords because they're hard. It's the moment where the game says, hey, we're not messing around here, and the music is just, oh my god, so good. You're expected for the majority of the game to die again again and again and learn from those deaths, which brings me to my next point. 
Another thing that is discussed at length in that interview about Demon's Souls is the player's experience of understanding what the game is trying to do. It doesn't at all reward you for the littlest of achievements, but instead focuses on providing the player with a feeling of catharsis after overcoming a challenge. To do this, the player must first fail. If you rush in, you will unforgivingly and consistently die. You're forced to step back and properly think through your plan of attack before going in, and if your plan fails, you learn from your mistake and approach differently, and that process repeats until you come out the other side feeling truly accomplished. In the words of Hidetaka Miyazaki, we really wanted players to focus on that part of the game, to feel the joy of having defeated challenges because they made the right choices. But to get to this point, you need failures, failures from which you learn. Kaji says, initially the plan was to have the game feature permadeath, where death of the character would result in the save file being erased. We all agreed we probably went too far with that, but it demonstrates the lengths we went to in exploring the meaning and mechanisms of death in the game when tuning that rewarding feeling the game was supposed to provide. It's probably for the best that they strayed from permadeath. What we were left with instead was a system where if you die, you lose all of your souls, and you have one chance to return to the place of your death to retrieve them. If you die again, they're gone for good. Hollow Knight has the same exact thing. Instead of souls, it's Geo. Both are currencies that are vital for progressing and making your character more powerful. And if you die and lose all of your Geo, it really sucks. There are consequences to your death, so your life is more meaningful. Something I'll never forget is my horrifying first experience with the area Deep Nest, which is a scary and dark and annoying area in the game where there are spikes everywhere and bugs are making noises in your ears and the floor keeps breaking and there are these little annoying guys that pop up everywhere and I fell down a big hole. I don't know where to get out. I When your life in the game holds so much value, you start to become very invested in learning the ins and outs of the dangerous world you inhabit. Which brings me to my third and final point. So far, we can call a Souls-like a game that is difficult, and you die a lot, and your death has a lot of weight. It seems like we're missing something because that's a pretty wide net. We're missing my favorite characteristic of Dark Souls and games like it, the story and world building. Our approach was really to try to sidestep preset narrative. There is no real story unfolding in front of you, rather the experience is all about you and the choices you're making step by step. If you skip through all the text dialogue in this game, there's really no story at all. You can browse your inventory and read flavor text for items to get some lore, but really the only pre-planned narratives you can find are given through the wacky cast of characters you meet along the way. And these are exactly what you would expect them to be, small side stories for small side quests. But there's not a main quest with a storyline, or rather there is a main quest, but it's not about or concerning any of the characters, no, it's about you, on the quest to beat this video game. And yeah, it might be difficult, yeah, you might get angry, break a controller or two on the way, but that makes it all the more exciting when you finally get the satisfying release of seeing the credits roll. There's definitely a deep, deep lore mine that you could dig into if you wanted, but the gameplay stands on its own pretty well without it. Miyazaki explains, we weren't built around cutscenes or scenario, as in so many action RPGs. Rather, our aim was to have the player feel rewarded simply by playing the game, not for completing a quest or finding a prize or winning loot, but simply by playing and experiencing the game. This kind of experience is so special and fits so well in the Souls format that whenever I see something similar in other games, it's hard not to draw comparisons. Take, for example, Hollow Knight. You are thrust into an unknown world knowing nothing about you or your environment, and your objectives are made very clear without too much hand-holding or narrative explanation. There's a brief cutscene stressing the importance of this egg temple that has three magoos on it, alright, okay, I gotta explore the world and find the three little magoos, pretty straightforward. And just like the Souls game, you have wacky characters you find on your journey who are on their own personal adventures. And these occasional encounters eventually turn into side quests. Although, I should say, Hollow Knight's method of storytelling definitely takes its own route. There's a lot more dialogue than you might expect, and a lot of lore, and some scripted story moments. But overall, there's not too much fluff, and the game makes sure your focus is on exploring and dying and learning. And then, eventually, there's a strong feeling of satisfaction when after feeling lost and taking a lot of damage in an area initially, you traverse through it enough times to learn exactly how to defeat every enemy on the path and weave through platforming segments with ease. It's empowering, it feels like 
like you've conquered the area. And as you progress, not only does your character gain more abilities, you the player are equipped with knowledge. And eventually you're familiar with every corner of the map and you feel like the king of the world. I feel that this relationship between the world and the player was something that From Software really wanted to cultivate in their games. So I also think it's an important trait for a souls like to have. I'm a fan of innovative, unique, risk-taking, genre-defining games. Demon's Souls did so many strange things with little regard for what was popular in the industry at the time. The developers followed an artistic vision to the end and created something truly special. It's no wonder that something so special went on to have so much influence on modern gaming, especially indie developers. It's not a stretch to say that if it weren't for From Software and their creativity, Hollow Knight wouldn't exist. Team Cherry did something spectacular by applying things like a Souls-style attitude towards death and an indifferent dark world to the Metroidvania genre. What we got was one of the most beautiful and compelling Metroidvanias ever, one of the greatest indie games of all time, and by all regards, a masterpiece. 4 out of 10.